help me out here. Let's get everybody back in their seats. Thank you so much. Can I say, I've been to a couple of these, you guys have been awesome so far. I'm going to turn the floor over to Annie Chow. She is one of our volunteer spotlight presenters, and she's a Benton County prosecutor. So, Annie, please take it away. Hi, guys. How are you guys doing? All shook it up? Yeah. <laughs> um, so, my name's Annie. I am a Benton County prosecutor. A little bit about myself. Um, I'm from originally Southern California and born and raised, one of 12 kids, and I'm the only lawyer out of 12 kids, so lawyer life was not on the radar for me. Um, single mom, and after high school, I, sorry, I was raised by a single mom. I realized how confusing that was when it came out. <laughs> So after high school, I did not take the traditional route like a lot of my friends who went straight to college. I went to community college for two years. And after going to community college for two years, I was able to save up enough money and transfer to UCLA. And from UCLA, I went to Gonzaga University for law school. Go Zags! A little bit about my day. Um, I get a lot of referrals from police officers who have contacted juveniles. And when I read those referrals, I review them, I see whether or not a crime has been committed. If a crime has been committed, what I do is I either file on it or I send it to diversion, which is an alternative program. Um, I read a lot, I talk a lot with law enforcement, I meet with our detectives, I work with the schools a lot, I'm working with the principals, the middle schools, the high schools, to make sure that everything is going well at the school, that the schools remain safe. It's one of my biggest priorities. Um, to be honest, I love my job. I love what I do. I love working with kids. I do a lot of rehabilitative therapeutic programs. I do drug court. Um, we work with kids who have substance abuse problems. We get them the help that they need. Um, so yeah, I really love my job. It's really satisfying. I get to help people and when I see people going in the right direction and making healthy decisions, it makes me feel like I'm actually making a difference. Any questions? Thank you, Annie. Do you have any advice for them? Anything that they should do? Anything that's worked for you? I think the best piece of advice I could give and share is it's okay that throughout your life you don't take the traditional route to success. There is no rule book that is out there for you guys to Google and then you just go step by step on how to be happy, how to be successful, how to land that job. Because I didn't. Like I said, I went to community college for two years because I was not the best high school student. Um, so. That and I was raised by a single mom, so financially going to college right out the bat was not an option. So I chose to go to community college, worked the entire time, and I made that decision to do it for myself. And I'm glad that I did it. Did I kind of feel bad that I wasn't like everyone else off at college right off the bat? Yeah. But then I look back, I realized that it made me a better person. I saved a ton of money. and. I know that I did what I needed to do to get where I am today. So right. it's okay that you guys don't take the traditional route. As long as you guys get there, don't worry about the journey. Thank you, Annie. Appreciate it. So we have some presenters that are ready for you. I'm gonna hey, Omar. Yeah. Omar, guess what? What? There is a Supreme Court justice in the house. A Supreme Court justice in the house. Sing 
signatures and all that, because you're going to want to put your name on that and turn it in later for a try. But I just want to make sure you all know that there was a Supreme Court justice in the house. All right, hold on. Take it away. Thank Can you give away a prize? Yeah, actually, I think we got we got to get going. We got to get going. I, we got social media cases. So we got two folks here again from the prosecutor's office. That I want to present to you guys. We got Sean Sand actually from the prosecutor's office, and we have a public defender. That's right, uh, Michael Van Van der Sis. Size. Oh, no. Size. Michael Van der Size. So we have these guys. are going to introduce themselves, tell you a little bit what they do, and teach you guys about uh, their area of the law. Thank you. All right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Mike Van der Size. I am a attorney with the Benton County Office of Public Defense. Um, I've been attorney now for a little bit over five years. Uh, I work predominantly in Superior Court, uh, doing everything from uh, lower level drug offenses to uh, murder and attempted murder cases. I'll let uh, Sean. I didn't know. Good morning, everyone. I'm Sean Sant, I'm the elected prosecutor here in Franklin County. Um, I you know, been a police officer in the past, I went in the military, and he talked about kind of a non-traditional route. It took me uh, almost five years to complete community college because I was working full-time uh, while I uh, did that. I did uh, a lot of hours as a reserve officer, and that kind of spurred my interest in, in law enforcement. So I think this has been a, a good experience for me. This is kind of where I wanted to be. It took me a, a lot longer uh, in years to get there. Um, but that was an interest that I had when I was in law enforcement to, to pursue going into the courtroom. And so I've been on both sides. I did defense work. Uh, I was a deputy prosecutor. And uh, now I, I'm serving my second term as the elected uh, prosecuting attorney. So I just wanted to talk uh, briefly about some of the cases that you heard about. You heard about uh, the officers giving you uh, some information about the dangers of uh, social media being on a cell phone. I just wanted to highlight one case that kind of uh, grabbed our attention and this recently went through our office. This points out kind of the realities. These officers weren't just making up those stories that social media can be a trap for, for you or for others or for other friends and sometimes you're going to be the one that's going to have to help those friends that get caught up in some of these kind of things. So the first case I want to talk about is uh, State versus Sergio McGonaghy Jr. This is a case of rape of a child in the third degree, and I put up there so everybody understands. Sometimes people hear the word rape and they, they don't quite understand what that means, but when we're talking about rape of a child, that doesn't mean that that person was necessarily forced into that situation. What we're talking about is uh, an individual that is too old that is having sexual intercourse with young kids. And so there's varying degrees from first degree being the most serious, that means a, a intercourse happened with a person under the age of uh, 12, uh, second degree is between 12 and under 14 years, and then third degree is someone between uh, 14 and under 16. So these are serious cases, and this is what we're seeing going on in our office. This is just a highlight of one of those that has recently completed uh, prosecution. It's gone up through the Court of Appeals, and it was affirmed. This individual uh, used Facebook to reach out to, to young victims. Sometimes on these type of cases, victims don't know the true age of the individual. Sometimes what will happen is this individual will get lucky. He will befriend one of your friends who happens to be the target age that they're looking for. Typically we see this as young as uh, 12, 13, 14 years of age. Once they have one of your friends as a Facebook friend, then what you get through Facebook as they're trying to promote their friendship and extension of friends, you're going to see, hey, this guy's friends with her. You might not realize that this person's 23, 24, 25 years of age. And so that's the danger. When you befriend someone on social media, you need to know who that individual is. You should know them personally, or at least have a friend that you trust that could say, oh yeah, I know him. He goes over to Kamaikin, or he goes to Kinokai, he goes to Pasco High. You want to be able to understand who you are inviting into your house. Would you invite a stranger into your house? But people do that every day on social media. So this is the case where he reached out with text messages and eventually this led to a meeting at the girl's apartment. The defendant was eventually charged with the crime of rape of a child in the third degree. After this person was charged, a warrant was sought. So like the officer said, they go through and they get a search warrant. They're able to pull up all the social media files. They're able to retrieve the account information from Facebook. Sometimes people think that because they've deleted information, it's no longer available. 
As the officers explained, and as we got on our case, we were able to obtain that information. We were able to obtain deleted text messages on the phone. We were able to uh, retrieve deleted messages through the Facebook Messenger program. Defendant reached out and asked the victim to delete those messages. Why is that important? That tells us as law enforcement, as, uh, as adults, it tells us that he knew the difference of right and wrong. He knew that what he was doing was breaking the law, and that's important. The victim reported this crime weeks after this occurred. It is not too late to report a crime. That's one of the things I wanted to highlight. Sometimes it takes uh, crime victims, and this includes adult crime victims of sex crimes especially. Sometimes it takes people a longer time to come forward and, and make disclosures. It's not too late. If you've been a victim, reach out to a trusted adult. Uh, you have counselors at school. We get many referrals that start that way. They reach out to counselors, they reach out to parents. In this particular case, the girl trusted her mother a few weeks after this occurred and shared what had happened. The report got made with law enforcement and that's how we were able to get all this information. The jury convicted the defendant as charged. He received a prison sentence. So these are serious cases. One of the things I wanted to talk about too, this was a murder case that we had a few years ago. Because I know that we're trying to focus on technology, I thought I'd share a little bit about uh, one, of the, one of the highlights of, of this case, it was kind of the, the first kind of case that we really started to see uh, text messages, internet search history, uh, and why this case was important. This was a serious case. It was, we charged a count of premeditated murder in the first degree and attempted murder in the first degree from a separate incident. Uh, going through, this thing started back in uh, March 3 of uh, 2011. Uh, this person moved in with her mother, and I'm just going to move through here real quick um, and talk about, I'm going to skip over a little bit of the timeline uh, in the interest of time. She was interviewed by detectives, kind of went through a little bit of that history, but just like the other case, what we were able to uh, retrieve was cell phone history, internet search history, and we were able to get some very good information. One of the things or the motives that we were able to show at trial was that this individual intended to get into the contents of her mother's safe. This mother had a safe in her bedroom. Uh, she had valuables in there. She had firearms in there. She had a lot of uh, important information in there. And what we were able to find is we were able to retrieve uh, from, the, from the contents of her phone, we were able to retrieve a video where she was trying to set up this video uh, to recover the combination of the safe. And I wanted to show that real quick. We're going to get up here, I'm going to skip through some of the other scenes, again, talking about the technology that's used. We use uh, forensic investigators, CSI, anybody watch CSI? Or other crime shows where you kind of look at that forensic laboratory information, trying to put out trajectory and figuring out DNA. This is all highlights from that crime scene. So you've got trained uh, individuals that are going through that. So I just wanted to go through real quick. Okay. Um, so I'm going to get through here real quick. <laughs> Premeditation, to show that we had to retri re retrieve, let's see here, if we get this thing to forward. This is a video of the safe, I'm going to show this real quick. As you can see, this is actually the suspect that was trying to place the cell phone in the, the bedroom. She's working with another person trying to figure out, hey, where can I capture this in the closet so she could capture the combination of that safe so she could get in. So this was helpful for us to prove the, the motivation and the fact that uh, this was a premeditated act. She had planned this. This was taken February 14th. We had the next incident that occurred. I'm going to skip over that. But here's one of the things that we saw that I thought was incredibly important in this case. Again, showing premeditation. This is evidence that was recovered from uh, computers and cell phones. Cell phones nowadays basically are computers. There's a lot of information that's stored on the cell phone. This individual did a search query on Google. This was on the morning of the actual homicide. She's searching in the term safe drill points. So if you type into Google safe drill points, this is what came up. So we were able to recover this kind of history. She's actually looking, how can I get into my mom's safe? We go through here, we look at bookmarks again, and this one is great. It's called illegal engineering. Prosecutors and law enforcement love to come across information that uses the term illegal engineering. So that's a great picture, right? We showed this to the jury. How do you think a jury would respond when they see, hey, this person's looking up safe cracking? Kind of shows the motivation of our case. 
Sir, can we get some questions from the audience? Yeah, uh, yeah we're going to have to start yeah. taking some questions right there. So we have a student uh, over here to get on the microphone. I'm not understanding. Why did uh, he try to kill her or killed her? Or so the question is, what, what, what's the motive? What, what's the motive behind this? And frankly, sometimes we can't figure out the motive. We, we understood from this case is this person was trying to get access to the contents of the safe, which included a lot of the valuables. Uh, we have another question? Right over there? Right over here? Right over there. So I'm done. Brady Van you know, middle school. You said you were prior military. What branch? Air Force. I have had family members in the Marines. And I have too. So I, we've kind of, you know, I've come from a long history of uh, military folks. So it was a great route for me. We get one more question over here. Yeah. Um, so I've actually been really interested in learning about medical examiner stuff. So how did the victim die? Uh, th this individual. Sorry. Yeah, th that's a good question. In the interest of time, I wanted to play the 911 call because at the very beginning of the 911 call, you could actually hear one of the gunshots. Uh, it was difficult even for the jurors. We couldn't testify to that because even though you could hear it, you really had to play it back. And I listened to the call several times. But the, the person was shot uh, first, and then there was a hatchet that was retrieved out of the garage to finish off the job. So. A knock to the head. And that was as law enforcement was called because part of the protocols, if there's a 911 call, law enforcement will respond to the house and figure out what was going on because that wasn't disclosed in the 911 call what was going on. Okay, thank you. Let's give a round of applause. Round of applause. And you guys will be, you guys be hanging around for the passport game so they can get to know you and chat with you a little bit in the afternoon. So I have to bring up two more Spotlight volunteers. Do we have uh, Ben Hernandez? Ben, how are you? Ben Hernandez is going to tell you a little bit about what he does, why he's here, and maybe some advice for the students. Hello, everybody. My name is Ben Hernandez. I'm with the Federal Defender's Office, the Yakima branch. I am the chief deputy there. And what our office does is we represent people who've been charged with federal crimes who can't afford a lawyer. So I am a federal public defender. I've been doing this job for about 15 years. Before that, I had my own office in Quincy and Moses Lake. And before that, I was a uh, prosecutor for Grant County, which is in Ephrata and Moses Lake. Um, what I do is uh, the people that I represent have been charged with uh, being felons in possession of firearms, serious drug crimes, um, pornography crimes, and bank robberies, all sorts of crimes. I, I like what I do. I've been enjoying it for 15 years. It's interesting. There's never a dull day. I get to work with the people who are actually charged with the crimes who, are gonna, who could go to prison. And uh, I enjoy that part because I feel that, from my, from my perspective, that's where I can have a more positive impact on the individual who's actually looking to go to prison for a very long time. Uh, we go to trial, uh, not very often, but that's what we do. We go to trial in federal court. Uh, one of the federal judges here, uh, federal Judge Mendoza, he's, uh, we work in his courtroom uh, frequently. We drive here every week, so it's a long drive from Yakima, but we're here. Um, what else? Come from a small town. I, I went to Gonzaga Law School, Gonzaga undergrad. Nice. <laughs> uh, it's not easy, uh, but if you set your mind to it, it there's nothing you can't accomplish. Uh, had four, uh, uh, three brother, a brother, and two sisters. And my parents were migrant workers, and you know we worked hard and just uh, you know they just instilled that the value of an education. So for you all who are here, good job for you. you need Take advantage of the opportunities that you have and uh, try to make a positive contribution to your school, to your communities, for your families, and uh, make the world a better place to live. Any questions? One question. Any question for Ben? One. There we go. Yes, sir. What is the small town called? Where I grew up? Quincy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, the rabbits, Jack Rabbits. <laughs> Thanks, Ben. Thank you, Ben. Give a round of applause. We have one more volunteer spotlight. Michelle Trump is going to tell you about what she does. Good morning. Morning. Good morning. Hello. I would again. Do it again. <laughs> I'm 
Michelle, and I actually um, represent youth. Um, I represent youth who have been charged with a crime. I also represent youth who have done nothing wrong, but through circumstances outside their control, um, their parents um, are alleged to basically not be taking care of them um, in some way or another. So sometimes um, the kids I meet with are uh, victims of trauma and they need somebody that can go in and fight for them, and that's what my job is. And I love my job. And I hope that um, I don't run into any of you in that particular forum, but if I do, um, it's my job to listen to what you have to say. I was very fortunate to grow up with a mom who um, answered all of my questions. If I, answered, I asked her why, why she was doing something, why we didn't do something, um, she answered me instead of saying, because I said so. That was a big point for her. And I try very hard to make sure that every youth that I speak with, I give those answers to. Because I understand that you guys don't necessarily always feel like you have a lot of control. Because you're youth. Grown-ups are telling you what to do. There's rules that you have to follow. And sometimes they don't always seem fair. I want to be able to explain to you what I'm doing, what your role in all of this is, and to be there and walk you through it. Because frankly, if you do end up in that situation, you're probably pretty scared. Can People are talking about um, detention or juvenile prison or big things like that. And I sometimes just having somebody to stand there and hold your hand while we're going through all of this um, is very helpful. Um, my favorite part of my job is um, probably all of the reading and the arguing. When I found out that I could argue for a living growing up, I knew that was the job that I wanted. And uh, every decision I made from that point on, I think I was about 14 or 15, was I asked myself, is this going to help me become a lawyer? And if it wasn't, I didn't do it. Um, so I, I knew very early on that was what I wanted to do. Um, I'm also married to a Washington State Patrol trooper. He was not a trooper when I married him. Because a lot of people wonder how that works out. Um, he actually used to um, work at a sawmill. And so he took the more non-traditional route where he didn't know what he wanted to do. Um, I did. I'd love to answer any questions you have. I will echo some of what everybody said. If you wouldn't want your grandmother or your parents or your cop to see anything, don't take a picture or a video. Don't post it. <laughs> and if you have any concerns when law enforcement is talking to you about something, about whether you might be in trouble, they're going to tell you about rights, about being able to talk to an attorney. You're not in trouble for exercising those. Ask to talk to one of us, because we'll talk to you and tell you what you should answer their questions. Does anybody have any questions? They do. Actually, we're going to have questions for her during the passport game. So make sure that each of these volunteers that you're meeting, they're going to be telling us just uh, you know what they do and a fun fact. And then you should be interviewing them outside during the break when we're doing the passport game. So let's give a round of applause. Michelle and Ben, thank you very much. Lisa, we're going to move on. I have a special presenter that's here, but we're going to do some passport game and questions right after she's done. So. Nancy Kim from the Bill and the Melinda Gates Foundation. She's here to present about what she does and the great work of the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. So Nancy, please take it away. Hi everybody. Um, Nancy is my name uh, and I'm an Associate General Counsel at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. I've been at the foundation for about five years and before that I uh, practiced law at a private firm in downtown Seattle. And I went to the University of Washington for undergraduate studies and also for law school. Yeah. Um, so if any of you guys are thinking about uh, going to college, you should be thinking about it and you should do it. Um, but also visit Seattle, uh, check out the UW campus. It's really beautiful. It's a really great school. Go to Haggett Hall, get some Froyo from the basement. Um, so the work that I do at the foundation um, what better way to talk about global justice, law, and technology than to do um, an overview of the work of the foundation? And I have a short video clip to sh um, show why we do what we do. 
even before Melinda and I got married, we were talking about the opportunity and responsibility we have to take the wealth that I was lucky enough to have from Microsoft and how we work together to give it back to society in the most impactful way. In the fall of 1993, Bill and I took a trip to Africa. That trip just started us on this learning journey of, of asking ourselves, what could be done? How could you make a difference in people's lives? I mentioned to them that I perhaps could give some time helping them with their charitable and community activities, but they were very supportive of my suggestion and said, by golly, let's do that, Dad. At the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, we have a core belief that all lives have equal value. And everything that we do is geared towards reducing inequity in the world and doing it at pace. That is why we call ourselves impatient optimists. A world where inequity is dramatically reduced. What does it look like? It's a world where every person has the opportunity to live a healthy, productive life. It's a big ambition that we tackle in four different ways. We ensure children and young people survive and thrive. We empower the poorest, especially women and girls, to transform their lives. We combat infectious diseases that particularly affect the poorest, and we inspire people to take action to change the world. Melinda and I have always believed in scientific breakthroughs, and the idea of both accelerating those and making sure that the <laughs> benefits, whatever advances took place, were available to everyone. So we're going to cut that short because um, we're running uh, short on time. Um, but the, the gist of the video is that uh, the foundation is um, made up of people that are, are impatient optimists working to reduce inequity around the world. And we believe that some of the world's biggest problems can be solved and we have a sense of urgency um, in doing that. And how we do what we do is by, um, one, yes, we give, a lot, give away a lot of funding, but um, more importantly, I think we ask for help, and we do that strategically. We ask for help from our grantees and partners um, and the people that are uh, in, this, in the communities that we're trying to reach. We ask them to help us understand the issues that they're struggling with. We ask for help from innovators and scientists and researchers to come up with creative solutions that are going to catalyze change to help reduce inequity in the world. And we look to others to um, inspire us, and we want to learn from their successes, and we also want to learn from their failures. So we do a good job of asking for help, and that's one way that we achieve our goals. And so I get to work with a lot of different program teams at the foundation. One of those is the um, water sanitation and hygiene team. And I have some examples from that team today, and that means that we get to talk about poop. Um, so you may be asking yourself, well, what's, what's the big deal about poop? You know, it's not like a disease area um, like polio that can be treated with vaccines. But what you might not know is that um, over 40% of the world's population doesn't have access to adequate sanitation facilities. And um, 2.5 billion people in the world practice open defecation, which is um, nature pooing or peeing, as my eight-year-old daughter learned at survival camp this summer. Um, 2.1 billion people in urban areas, so densely populated cities or uh, slums, don't have access to adequate sanitation. And you can imagine that that much waste in the environment is going to affect your water, it's going to affect your food supply, and it's going to have some devastating health effects. And 1.6 million kids under the age of five every year die from diarrhea diseases. So it's, it's a real issue, um, and it's um, become, clean water and sanitation has become one of the goals of the UN. Um, and countries like India have launched national campaigns to address um, sanitation, and uh, private funders like the Gates Foundation have made it a core um, part of their strategy for reducing inequity in the world. And how we do that, one way we do that is by um, targeting innovative technologies. And we are challenging researchers and entrepreneurs to come up with creative solutions that might radically improve sanitation in the developing world. One of those technologies is called the Omniprocessor. 
Um, this was something that was developed in Washington for the foundation, and this particular unit is the first version of this technology. It's been shipped to um, Dakar, Senegal, and basically it's a reinvented sewage treatment plant. So sewage goes in, and what this technology does is to turn that into clean ash, electricity, and water. Um, here's the city of Dakar, it's about 3.4 million people, it looks like a regular city, but over a million people in that city don't have um, a sewer connection. And so they use pit latrines and other unsafe facilities in or around their homes. And most of these people can't afford to have a septic truck come and um, pump out the sewage uh, from their latrines. And so they have to do it by hand, which is really dangerous, as you come into contact with the pathogens. And it's also, you know, you can see it's just a, it's using a bucket. So it's going to get into the environment and, and contaminate the groundwater. And where there are uh, trucks, they're emptying um, the waste into treatment plants, as you would expect. But a common problem in the developing world is that these treatment plants aren't um, built to handle the capacity that's coming in. This particular treatment plant gets 10 times more waste than it should. And so the result is that the water isn't properly treated. You can see here, this water is in a holding tank after it's been treated and it should be crystal clear, but there's a lot of contamination there. Um, and it just gets dumped back into the environment. And sometimes it gets sent to, to farms um, to be used for irrigation, even though it's still full of pathogens. I know we had to, um, you know, everybody wants to talk about poop, right? But let's, <laughs> can, we're gonna, can we take one or two questions? Sure. Okay, so if we can open it up for questions. Anybody have a question? Who knew attorneys could be right. involved in this type of work? Raise your hand if you knew there were attorneys working and doing this kind of stuff across the world. Not I. Not a lot, right? So just because you go to law school to become an attorney, you don't have to necessarily argue cases. You can actually be making a difference in the lives of people in countries all over the world. Yeah, question. Um, my name is Tyler from Highlands Middle School. And what is your favorite part of your job? My favorite part of my job is um, actually taking the experience that I had in, in the commercial sector, because um, I used to work at a law firm where I supported software companies and tel telecommunications companies, taking that knowledge about how to transact around technology and applying that towards furthering the mission of the foundation. Um, Let's give it a round of applause. Thank you, Nancy. Get the law students up here, please. All the law students. Mira. We got some strong women up here right now. Look at this. We got some reps, and what I'm going to ask them to do is state their name, the school they're going to, the year they're in school, and your high school that you graduated from. Okay? Hi there, I'm Maddie Flood. Um, I go to the University of Washington School of Law, Hi. Huskies, Hi. and I'm a second year, so we call it a 2L in law school. And I grew up in California, so I went to a high school called Santa Cruz High. I'm Geraldine Enrico. Um, I went to Kent Meridian High School in Kent. I went to GU for undergrad and SU now for law school. I'm a 3L, so I'm graduating in May. I'm almost done. Hey, everybody. My name is Leah. I'm also a second year at Seattle U School of Law. And um, I also grew up in California. So for undergrad, I went to University of California, San Diego. But for high school, I was in Reno, Nevada. So I went to high school called Galena. Thank you. Hi, my name is Catalina, and I am a second year um, slash concurrent LLM at um, UW Law. And I grew up in California, in Chile, because I'm from Chile. So I guess I have two high schools, um, a Catholic one, and then Santa Monica High School. And I'm Amira. I am a 2L at UW Law. And um, I went to UW for my undergrad, so I'm a double husky. And I, grew, I went to high school at Jackson High School, which is a little up north from Seattle. Thank you so 
much. Now remember, these are law students. So if you're interested in hearing their journey from high school to law school, make sure you go talk to them because they're going to be at the college fair answering questions, taking names, handing out stuff. There's all kinds of things. Make sure you talk with them and find out more about what they do, especially young women. You know, this is pretty cool. We got some really powerful young women coming up, and they're going to be leaders in the community. So keep an eye on these ladies, because they are going to make some difference in the world. So make sure you check them out, OK? So talk to them during the thing. We've got two more spotlights, and we're going to ask them. You know, Omar's going to introduce them, and we're going to ask them just to give some quick, quick details about uh, their name, school, fun fact. And remember, they're going to be available to answer questions through the passport game. Okay, so we have two more volunteer spotlights. So we have first Jennifer Tarami. She's with the FBI. So watch what you say. Uh, please, Jennifer, tell them what you do and, and why you do it. Hi, I am Jennifer Tarami. I am an FBI special agent. I work out of our Yakima office. And I joined the FBI 19 years ago. My background is in accounting. I was a CPA for three years in Seattle, and I graduated from the University of Washington. Joined the FBI. First, they sent me down to San Francisco, and then I had the opportunity to transfer back to Washington, so I took that in 2004. One of the great things about the FBI is just the amount of opportunity within the organization and the variety of things we work. Uh, we are federal investigators, so we're similar to detectives, but on a, uh, we do federal crimes. So there is a little bit of a difference in jurisdiction, but a lot of overlap, too. Um, in my career, I've worked white collar, terrorism, crimes against children, violent crime, bank robberies. So there's a lot of different things that we work, and that's one of the great things about the job is there's so much variety. Um, we also have offices all over the country as well as all over the world, so there's been opportunities to travel and do all sorts of interesting things, working on high-profile cases and whatnot. So looking back in my career over the last 19 years, I can truly and honestly say that I've there's probably only been a handful of days that I haven't looked forward to going into work. Like even after coming back from vacation, I look forward to going to work. So um, it's, it's great to have something or to work in a career where it doesn't feel like a job. So um, please come find us. There's a couple of us here from the FBI. So if you have any questions, please come find us during the passport game. Thank you. Thank you, Jennifer. A round of applause for Jennifer. Now we have Officer Ray Aparicio. Hey guys, how you doing? I'm also Ray Aparicio. I've been with the Pasco Police Department for 15 years. I'm from the same small town of Quincy, so I was a Quincy Jackrabbit. Um, I uh, worked out in the fields when I was young. In migrant work, that's just what we did. Um, I grew up, I, even though my, my dad used to be a former gang member, my brother eventually got involved in gangs, no matter how hard I tried to be, I couldn't. I was just too nice of a guy. So I, I kind of figured one day I was probably going to go into law enforcement, and here I am. Uh, I went to the community colleges of Spokane, then I went to Eastern Washington University, where I was a psychology major. Um, I, uh, what was that? Oh, thanks. All right. <laughs> I, I really enjoy what I do. I, I love being in law enforcement. I was on the SWAT team for six years. I'm a firearms instructor. I, I really, really love this job. Um, it has its really good, good days, where it's the best job in the world, and it has its really, really bad days, where it's the worst job in the world. You know, you go to a collision where a child has died, you're trying to do CPR on a child that's, that's dying. Those, those are really, really tough days. Uh, but, hey, uh, I really do enjoy this job and the differences it can be. So when you get burned out, because you will get burned out when you're on patrol, you get burned out, there's so many other things you can do, like detectives, school resource officers, um, you know, area resource officers, just so many different things that you can do. So, hey, thank you for being here today, and I was told I had a couple minutes. <laughs> thank you, officer. That's great. Let's give a round of applause. Do you guys want prizes? Can I get a yes? Okay. Omar, you got some questions? I do. Give a tough one because we got a swag bag with Google glasses. You know yes. log swag, discover log swag, and I think I got a gift card for them, so make it good. Okay.
Okay, let's see if I can make it good. So we had some law students that were up here a second ago, and one of them was Leah. Leah, can you raise your hand or stand up so they can see you? Okay, that's Leah. So Leah gave us a little bit of background on where she's from, where she went to school, what she did. I want to know, you guys got to listen to the question first, and Leah's going to correct me if I don't get this right. I want to know where she went to law school, where she went to undergrad, and where is she from originally? So what state? Someone in blue? Do we see someone in blue back there? I was told this first. Over there, they're coming to you. Okay, so okay. I want to hear your name, your school, and then I'm going to ask you the questions again. Okay, so stand up. Hello. Um, my name is Isabel, and I go to Highlands Middle School. Highlands Middle School, all right, awesome. Now, I'm going to ask you the questions again. Leah, she went to law school, undergrad, and where did she kind of grow up? Where was she before that? So tell me. California. California. Okay, check. So is that undergrad, or? Where did she go to law school? What are the other schools? in Seattle University. Seattle University Law School, okay. So before undergrad, where was she? In Rio. Yeah, go ahead. It's in Rio. It's close. Reno? Reno? Maybe? Yeah! Oh That's very good. Two out of three, two out of three. Omar, this section over here in the back, Omar, this, I'm over here in the back. This section over here has been kind of silent, and I'm getting worried that they haven't been like paying attention. But some back here have said they've been paying attention, I've got and prizes. they want some prizes. All so right. the focus is going to be on this back sector over here. All right, so so you all better be ready. I'm going to just do those three tables back there. I see a lot of athletes with jerseys on and stuff. They probably weren't paying attention. So <laughs> let's see. It's going to be easy. Don't be here. Uh, Catalina. Catalina, right? She's also a law student, but her background is maybe a little different. So I want to know, she says she went to high school. Where did she go to high school? And where did she go to law school? So she gave us two places that she, she kind of spent her time in high school. Is that right? Okay. They just need two out of three? Yeah, give me two out of three. So where did she go to law school? Where did she go to high school? I know you were, oh, my name is Natalia, I'm from Review. I, I know you were from California, too. California. Um, and you went to law school at UW. Guys, okay, yeah. Do you know what country she was at before that? What country? Yeah, make it three out of three. Somewhere in South America. Uh, Give her a hint. You got two out of three, so I was just, I was just kind of teasing. Okay, that was a good job. Chile, Chile, Chile. Uh, don't worry, there'll be more prizes. Okay, one more. One I want to see the guys with guy the jerseys on. Okay. So, well, I don't know. It's Denver Broncos. Let's see. Maybe it's because they were wearing right. locks. We had Jennifer. Jennifer okay. Ferrani. Is it still this back sector? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Let's see. Oh, those three we're teams. Here, I'm telling you guys. Them. I said you got a one. Yeah, these three, those three tables back there, the three, the three in the back. Jennifer Tarami, she told us what she did before she became an FBI agent. What did she do? What was her career? Oh, okay. Nice. Okay. Hi, my name is Josie, and I got a Clonus. Welcome. She was an accountant, right? Jennifer, is that right? I got it. Nice. Good job. Where should we go now, Lisa? I think uh, we've got the front corner. Here? Front corner is falling asleep over there. Front I don't corner. know. Okay, so I want to see some action. These three tables right here. I don't want them just to raise their hand. They need to stand. Stand and deliver. So right. first to stand with the right answer, we'll so get I'm a focusing, prize. I'm focusing on you three. These three tables right here. You are my audience. So, we had Officer Ray Mauricio came up, he kind of told us what he did. He said he was an instructor of something. Do you remember what he, what he was an instructor of? Oh, okay. All right. 
What's your name? What's your school? My name is Mecca. I go to New Horizons. <laughs> and we're Jasmine. Strokes like the guns, right? Firearm. Firearm structure. Good job. Nice. Lisa, maybe one more, and then I got a special speaker. And this is going to be for the whole crowd, because we got the folks that were kind of sleeping in the back, because I want to give away another big swag bag, because it's a Discover Lab bag with Google Glasses, 3D Google Glasses. Did I say that? 3D Google Glasses. And you can look at the scarf from UW in the 3D, looking at that, and then you have some other treats, and then I got a gift card. So this is a big one, and we're going back in time. Back in time. This is a tough one. I got it. So Omar, Catalina, can you be our spotters here? So it's going to be all the crowd. So first to stand and catch their attention is going to be the winner of this prize. Judge Mitchell. Well, we've been, we've been playing. the two. I've been giving him a hard time because he's a WSU grad. But you know what? In the end, I don't care where you go to college. I just want you to go. Okay, it's more important to me that you just keep pushing and keep going. And community college, college, just get there. Don't let anybody tell you no. But Judge Mitchell said that he has his favorite assignment. Okay, he works in Superior Court. But he said right now, he serves as this kind of judge at this court, and it's one of his favorite assignments. Okay, one more time. Where are my spotters? Get to the middle. You ready? Remember, one, two, three. I see someone in the back. He caught my attention right back there. That one. Yep, yep, yep. He's in the brown shirt, standing right there. Red jump, jump. I gotta see him jump. I wanna see him jump right there. Get some excitement. Let's see if he gets it right. Judge Mitchell is what judge at what court, and it's his favorite assignment. Say your name and your school. Uh, my name is Miguel. I go to Okay, everybody hold your breath. Let's see if he gets it. Hi. Hi. <laughs> um, hi, my name is Miguel. I go to Ochoa Middle School, and the answer is adoption. Oh. Oh, here? Oh, no, here you got a prize. Here you got a prize. Right here? This? Right here? We didn't get a prize. Right there. Oh, who was it? I go one more time. Judge Mitchell is currently serving as this kind of judge at what court? Uh, my name is Luis. I go to Chihuahua High School. And his favorite is Superior Court. No. Oh, he went to Superior. My name is Mark. I go to <laughs> I go to Walla Walla High School, and the answer is juvenile. Juvenile court. What kind of judge is he there? Um, he is the blank judge. Should be. You're changing the rules, Lisa. You're changing the rules. Hello. <laughs> Can't you help? Presiding. Yes. yes. Presiding judge of juvenile court. That's Judge Mitchell's favorite position because he knows he can make a difference with kids. So make sure you go talk to Judge Mitchell. Make sure you go talk to Judge McCullough. He's over there in the corner hiding out. Go seek them out. Find out information during the pipe the whole passport game. And I think we've got to call up someone pretty cool right now. So I want you all to stand. Because all rise. All rise. Because Omar is going to introduce someone pretty cool. All rise. So Justice Mary Yu is one of my favorite people of all time. She's, she's a justice in the Washington Supreme Court. She's from the south side of Chicago. And she's going to tell you a little bit about her story and her background. But she's also going to have a big ask of you, which I think is why you're here. You're going to kind of 
You need them. I think we need them all. So, so Justice Yu, please inspire us like you always do. I'm glad you're here. Thank you so much. First of all, go ahead and sit down. I've been wondering if people have been listening. Boy, it's hard to give away prizes, isn't it? So my name is Mary Yu. I sit on your state Supreme Court, which is the court, the highest court in the state of Washington. There are nine justices on the state Supreme Court. You've heard the phrase, the buck stops here. You've heard that phrase? How many of you heard that phrase? The buck stops here, right? At the end of the day, it's the principal's office, or it might be your mom and dad are home, or it might be your grandmother, but somebody at the end of the day has the final word, right? That's what the Supreme Court is in the state of Washington. We have the final say on the law in the state of Washington as it relates to state law. So we deal with cases that you've heard about. We also deal with cases that are very, very serious, like the death penalty. We decide cases that involve our Constitution. So let me just say a couple of things to you. And the first thing is, thank you for being here. Thank you for caring enough about yourself to take a little time today to listen to others, to talk with people, to maybe get inspired and to dream about what you might do. I'm going to tell you something about myself, and I only have a few minutes, but I wanted to just publicly thank one of the lawyers that you heard from. She got cut short here today. Her name was Nancy Kim, who was working for the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, and she talked to you about... What did she talk to you about? Poop! Right? She talked to you about poop. Something that seems so ordinary, every day, almost something we don't talk about, and yet she talked about the problem of disease, right? And how it robs the opportunity for children to even live. She does her work as a lawyer, an intellectual property lawyer, a lawyer who helps to try to come up with solutions to big problems. That's why I'm here today, to say that each one of you could be like Nancy Kim. Each one of you could be like Bill or Melinda Gates, somebody who has a vision and who says, I'm not comfortable leaving things as they are. I want to make them better. What would I do if I had a billion dollars like Bill Gates? Would I turn around and give that money away? I don't know. I might be a little bit more selfish. They are giving their money away to try to save lives. Every lawyer that you've heard from today, the prosecutors, the police officers, the public defenders, are doing the same thing, trying to make our community better. So I'm here to issue an invitation to each of you to dig down deep in your heart, in your mind, and imagine what you want to do with your life. And then what I'd like you to do is to do it. Get there. Believe in yourself. I'm at the State Supreme Court, and I never thought that I could be in the highest position as a judge in the state of Washington. I grew up on the south side of Chicago in a pretty poor family. I never had my own bedroom. My mother was undocumented. My father was undocumented. They came to this country with no papers, right? Today, they get thrown out. 50 years ago, they were given an opportunity to regularize their status. And that's why I'm here. I'm here because my parents believed in an education because they didn't have any. They believed that education was going to be the only way that their kids could maybe have a better life than they did. 
My mother said to me, look at my hands, Mika. I don't want your hands to be like mine. Dirty, rough, cut up from working fields, right? My mother said, I want you to have the opportunity to go to school, to be able to read, to be able to write. My father's English was broken, and people made fun of him all the time. And I was embarrassed. Now, I could have gone and hidden away, but because of my parents' belief that maybe I could do something good for someone else, they supported me in my dream and in my education. I never knew I wanted to be a judge. I didn't know I even wanted to be a lawyer. I worked right after I got out of college. And then suddenly I realized I wanted to make life better for others. And that's when I decided to go to law school. And I just happened to be in the right place at the right time to have the opportunity to be a judge. I'm not smarter than anybody else. The one thing that I do really well is I work hard. I read everything twice. I take a lot of notes. I outline. I stay up really late to study because I don't think I'm as smart as everybody else. So I work twice as hard. And that's why I'm here today, to invite you to do the same. I'm getting old, believe it or not. And I'm looking for my replacement. I'm looking for somebody else who's going to take my spot at the Supreme Court. Now, I want you to also know that I was the first woman of color to be on the state Supreme Court. I was the first Latina, right? The first Asian. And the first member of the LGBTQ community to be at the state Supreme Court. So what I'm saying to you is I need you to step it up. I need you to think about being my replacement. Take my spot when I retire. Be there. I need you to be the leaders to inspire your friends, your little sisters and brothers, your neighbors, your siblings. I need you to be the people in today's world who are going to stand up and say, I believe an opportunity for all. I believe in equality for all. I believe that we will not be divided by our differences, but we will come together because of what we have in common. We are one nation. We have certain principles and beliefs. And each one of you are so important to me and to this community and to the courts in the state of Washington. We need you, we want you, and I want you to always remember that. Have a good day. I'll be here throughout the day to talk with you. Come visit me in Olympia. Thank you, Justice Yu. Justice Yu is one of our favorite, favorite, favorite peoples ever because she's so supportive of us students. Um, if you could please give me your attention for one moment. We're going to have the other sheriff, he's going to kind of, again, give us a brief, maybe one minute, what's going on, and then how we're going to transition over to the, the thermal imaging. So if you're in here, I love it that you guys are engaged and you're hanging out. We're going to just give the under sheriff our attention. Thank you very much. Thank you. Under sheriff, I'm going to turn to you, maybe a quick description of what's happening. You've got everyone's attention, let them know what's coming up next. All right, everyone. Uh, like I said a little bit ago, uh, some of you guys were getting your food, so you didn't hear. Uh, we've got a DJI One UAV, uh, or drone. Uh, we use it for all sorts of things. Uh, search and rescue, we use it to uh, investigate fires, help the fire department, document basically houses that burned down, buildings that burned down. We also use it uh, for tactical response missions to when we have to go somewhere and we feel that it might be a little unsafe or somebody may be waiting for us, we send the drones in there first, kind of give us a heads up of what's out. Now, what we have, we have two cameras. We've got a 4K camera 
which uh, unfortunately in here it's not giving us the best signal because of how well this building is built. Uh, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> we also have a FLIR camera and the FLIR camera basically is just like you see on, on, on TV, you know, it senses and it can pick up heat signatures from whatever's out there. It works best in the fall through winter time because of the fact that everything outside is colder than us or anything living and stuff like that. Uh, we're in the middle of switching cameras out right now and uh, we'll, we'll give you a, a little brief um, show and tell of it here in a minute. Thank you, Under Sheriff. We appreciate you. So he's going to step in once more, more or less, whenever he wants to show you something or point something out, he'll, he'll step in. But I also want all the volunteers. We have the volunteers here. They're going to take part in the passport game. Can you stand up or let us know? Wave. Passport. Okay, awesome. Great. I'm glad you're all here. Uh, maybe in about five minutes or so, you, you should go to your spots outside where we're going to kind of play the game and have the students come out. So you have about... Okay, so you should know where you're going to be if you don't. Come up and ask me. But in about five minutes or so, right? Sorry, uh, all volunteers, if you're in the passport game because your name is on the passport card, um, judges and attorneys will stay in this room. All the other volunteers, go out to this uh, atrium area and find your like career name tent. That'll show you which area to pretty much stick around and wait for kids to come to you, talk to you, and then give your signature. So judges and attorneys in here, everyone else, go find your career tent if you are a volunteer. And if you guys have any questions at any point, feel, feel free to raise your hand and uh, I'll try to answer if I know. So basically right now, guys, what Deputy Barnes did is he, flipped, he switched out the cameras and we're kind of showing you what we can see from the, from the air when uh, we're flying over a, a certain place. In the summertime, it can be pretty difficult because the sun pretty much warms everything, right? The, the concrete, the trees, rocks, everything. Um, but fall time, winter time, when it starts to get cold outside, it works much better. So as you can see, uh, that person, I'm not exactly sure who it is right now, <laughs> but uh, you can see he pretty much sticks out from the trees, bushes, stuff like that. And we'll see if we can't get a better signal. The cool thing about this camera too, everyone, is that uh, now again, we're still kind of new to us, but we can actually set temperature ranges to show up at a different color. So if we want something that's between 90 degrees and 100, which is basically our temperature, right? What's our temperature usually? Anyone? 98.6. And it was six. Six or three. My wife's a PA, I should know that, but, right. So uh, we, can, we can actually have it show up with like a little, a different, a different uh, color. We also have different color palettes to show up. Right now, I think it's on white hot, so anything warm will show up white. Uh, he can switch it over to black hot. He can sh switch it over to where the screen in the background is like a, a reddish color, and uh, anything hot is like white. Um, and I think right now, on the display, it'll tell you how far away it is. Right now, it's uh, 96.8 feet in high. Away from the remote control, it's uh, 50 feet. And it'll also tell you how fast it's flying when you're returning it. Some really cool features about this drone is if it loses contact with the remote, it'll return right to, back to where it took off. Uh, it, it knows how to get back. If it's starting to run out of batteries and we're not paying attention to it, it'll tell us on the display that the batteries are running low. But if we still don't pay attention to it because something might be happening where we don't, we don't see it, it by itself will come back. So if it gets down to like 10%, it can calculate how far away it is 
and it knows that it'll need 8% to get back, it'll come back at 8% regardless of what we do. So. Well, we got a runner. We got a runner. We got a runner. <laughs> right? So he could be hiding just about anywhere. Uh, we also have a canine unit in our, in our department. And teaming both of those guys up, uh, bad guys don't stand a chance. Usually. Yep. Oh, under sheriff, what's the training like for for, for being an operator? Yeah, for, for us, um, we we pretty much it, state leaves it up to us. We had to apply for permission to fly and all that stuff, and they give law enforcement certain special permissions to to where you don't have to go get technical training, but you do have to be responsible for your pilot. So you you as a department have to put your own training together and. Uh, know that if anything goes wrong you're going to be held accountable for for what happened you know what i mean so we what we do with with any deputy that wants to be a drone pilot is we put them through a, a skills course we, we make sure that they can launch it manually or use the ipad um and just just that we get them we get them time on the we get them time on it just, we're lucky where our office in othello has this huge green yard in the back where we get to pretty much fly it whenever we want. Great. Do you guys have any questions for the under sheriff? Go ahead. I think we have one here. How fast does it go? I believe this one will go up to 32 miles an hour if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. It'll stay in the air for around 15 to 20 minutes depending on the weather outside. If the wind's blowing really hard and it has to work harder, obviously it'll use more battery time. Yes, ma'am. Do you know how fast an average person can fly? I do not. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Okay. So there. I'm not sure if ours has it. The, the question was, if a plane ever comes close to it, what will the device do? Well, we made sure, like today, before we launched, we had to contact the airport, we had to contact their uh, tower, and let them know what we were doing. By law, we can't go up above 400 feet. So, right now, again, he's only at 100 feet. If there's any planes flying at 100 feet right now, we're in trouble, right? So, we try to make sure and find out um, what our, ceiling, what our ceiling is, we tell them. If we're near an airport, we'll let them know, hey, we're not gonna be above 150 feet. We're not gonna be above whatever. But we do have up to 400 feet. Some of them, I'm sorry, but to answer your question, some of them come with anti-collision sensors that will not let it run into trees or, or anything like that. But as far as something else flying near it, I don't know if it could react that fast to avoid it. Anything else? Again, these are the different color palettes where you can change them out to, to make it uh, make the, the person that you're looking for or the thing. Because sometimes when we're out looking for or just training, we can spot deer, spot coyotes, and stuff like that. So we have to pretty much get close enough to where we can tell that it's not a person. All right, can I get you guys to get under sheriff? Coronado, a round of applause, please. Thank you. Thank you. Again, he'll, he'll, he'll be around, right, uh, Sheriff? You'll be here. You'll be here for the other yeah, yeah. questions. Yes, sir. So please feel free to come up to under Sheriff if you have any questions. <laughs> now I want to I want to let you guys know that we're going to shift over. Hi. Hello. Hello. Shh. Hi. Hi, everyone. It's good to see you again. Lunch was great. Now we're going to transition over to the passport game. So if you have your your student packets in front of you. I'm gonna quickly walk through the instructions and then I'm gonna let you guys loose. So Miguel Willis, Miguel Willis, where are you at, man? Miguel Willis is one of my good friends. We spent some time together in law school. I'm gonna give you a quick, quick intro, is that okay? You're good to go? Uh, so Miguel Willis, Miguel Willis graduated from Seattle U Law School last year. Uh, last school year, right? It was last June. Oh, you were good. Wow. Wow, you're doing big things. 
So his big area of interest is how technology and the law intersect to make a difference. How do we solve really tough social justice, criminal justice issues using both technology and the law? He's a really good friend of mine. I'd love it for you guys to get to know him. So Miguel Willis, please, if you could come up and kind of introduce yourself and give us, uh, give us some wisdom. presenting on how technology can expand legal access. Uh, so on the presentation, I'm just gonna give you a background of what I do and uh, talk a little bit about the access to justice gap, uh, the practice of law versus legal service delivery, uh, how tech and innovation can increase access to justice, and uh, wrapping up why we need you, everyone in this crowd, to be a part of this uh, change and to close the gap. So just a little bit about me. Uh, went to Howard University for undergrad, uh, BA in political science and economics, finishing up CRU this uh, uh, winter. Um, I run a program called the Access to Justice Technology Fellows Program. What we do is train law students all across the country how to leverage technology, design, uh, user-centered, uh, uh, design, project management, and a host of other skills in terms of solving complex legal problems. Um, we had fellows, uh, 10 fellows, this summer working on projects within legal aid organizations. Uh, up there on the far right, that was one of our fellows uh, working at Legal Aid Society of Hawaii, building a technology platform to help pro bono attorneys, meaning pro, uh, attorneys that work for free uh, to better uh, but conveniently serve clients. Um, and I currently uh, work for, also work for the Alaska State Court System uh, on a project up there uh, in Anchorage. I get to travel throughout the state of Alaska basically to talk to people, understand what their problems are, what their unique problems are, if you can imagine, Alaska has some very, very unique uh, problems because they're in a very uh, remote place, uh, a, a very scarcity of resources and uh, a climate, um, and a lot of problems. So, uh, about the access to justice gap. Uh, the justice gap, it refers to the difference between civil legal uh, needs of low-income Americans and the uh, resources available. So uh, if you can understand in criminal law, everyone is afforded an attorney through uh, Gideon. Uh, but in civil law, meaning if you have a housing issue, uh, uh, you go to the doctors and can't afford the bill, uh, you know, or get denied benefits, a debt collection issue, you're not afforded uh, an attorney. And you know, s over 60, 60 million Americans currently live in poverty uh, and can't afford an attorney. And almost, um, in, in the state of Washington, uh, on average, uh, you know, number of legal problems per household, 9.3, 2014, uh, 70, 5% can't get, has a, at least one legal problem. That's, so that's 3.3 per household. 80% uh, of people that have legal problems, 86% people that have legal problems can't get legal help. So imagine if you came and you scored a 14% on a test. That's failing, right? So we're, we're failing Americans in terms of providing 
legal access, ensuring justice. Um, it's not a laughing matter, it's, it's serious. Most people can't get a lawyer, can't get legal help. And underlying that legal uh, access problem is an access to information problem. Uh, people don't even know where to go when they have a legal problem. They know they have a problem, so hypothetically if I get kicked out of my house, I know I have a problem because I have no home, but trying to jump the hurdle and the gap to understand that this is a, a, there could be potential legal problems within that situation, uh, it's very hard. Um, so who does this affect? Who does the civil justice gap affect? Seniors, um, rural residents, people living in urban communities, veterans, persons with disabilities, uh, parents and children under 18, um, survivors of domestic violence, all types of populations have trouble, additional barriers in terms of getting legal access. So I, I just wanted to kind of uh, tell a story um, to, to help paint that picture even clearer. So just yesterday, uh, again, I worked uh, in a project in Alaska. I flew from Barrow uh, down here. So that's the top, top, top of Alaska, uh, right facing the Arctic Ocean. Um, where uh, currently right now there's three hours of sunlight. Um, temperatures are ranging from zero to uh, 20 degrees. Uh, very rural, native population facing language access and uh, just a cultural uh, you know, divide between the community and the native village. Um, and as you can see, very high cost of living. They have cases of water for the very low, low price of $29 for a single pack of water. Um, and right above that, you see that was a, a hotel, uh, that was a sign coming right up in my hotel, watch out for polar bears. So it's, it's a very, very interesting, unique place. So all the way up in rural Barrow, Alaska, how do people get legal help? You know, so these are the challenges that, you know, I'm trying to solve. Um, so I have a question. <laughs> <laughs> Who here can tell me, uh, oh yeah, if you answer the question, you get a gift card, or a gift, uh, a giveaway. Okay. <laughs> Who here can tell me what these industries and companies have in common? Oh, we got some hands, okay. Uh, oh, this is good. In the middle, you're waving excitedly. Wait, I got the mic. I got okay. the mic. <laughs> I got the juice. <laughs> <laughs> My name's Raylin. I'm from Highlands Middle School. Um, Hi, Raylin. They all kind of like sell stuff. They all have stuff for sale, and they all have home stuff like beds and stuff or a place to be. Okay, that's true. All of them make money somehow. Okay, not all of them. Uh, we're we're going to go somewhere else with this. Right here. Blue. Uh, my name is Andrew Carson. I'm from Kennewick High School. Hey, Andrew. They're all shut down. Close, really good, really good. They're all gone, they're just, they're just no more. They, <laughs> partially correct. They're all obsolete. As a, a lawyer would say maybe. So that, that is partially right. Um, so that's, I think that's good. So Blockbuster, Kmart completely extinct. Um, hotel industry and the taxi cab industry suffers right now. And as a second part of that question, I just gave it away, maybe. Uh, why are these companies extinct, or why are these industries suffering? Who, who, over here? Wait, you point them out, you point them out. Okay. All right, you guys do that. Uh, I'm Mia Casper from Chinook Middle School. It's did you, did you look up there? What? Did you look up there for that? No, I knew, I knew it before. Okay. Uh, is, it, is it because they're, they're all being replaced? Yes, by who and what? By like the new generation of stuff and like technology. Exactly. Good job. Good job. 
technology, disruptive innovation. Um, Netflix, people used to go to the movies, uh, go to a thing called Blockbuster and actually physically go. Now we can stream that uh, movie at your home, from your computer, from your phone, for only $9 a month. Uh, Uber, um, getting a taxi cab is hard, uh, especially for me, because I'm a black male, but for you know a lot of in other inconveniences. Uh, so Uber, uh, you know, sh car sharing, Airbnb, they're disrupting the hotel industry, and you know, not all of it is technology. You know, some of it is innovation, trying new things. Okay, so another question. Uh, who here can tell me what the practice of law is? All the way back there. Uh, it was a confident hand raised. Hold on, Brittany. So hi, I'm Brittany from Kennewick High, and the practice of law. Are you looking for the name or? Practice. What, what consists of the practice of law? It's usually like just working, try, basically just trying to get justice for everyone, whether it's working cases or doing, I guess, charity work. But I guess that's my best answer. Uh, yeah, that's right. I do have gift cards too, so I'll find those people after. Good job. Um, I think I have them here. So yeah, that's, that's partially correct. Uh, counseling clients on legal matters, advocating on their behalf, transactions and disputes, briefs, motions, appearing in court, using professional judgment, uh, and lots of writing research. Delivery of legal services is completely different. Using data uh, uh, for a law firm, using data uh, to make informed decision making, uh, to make your clients happy because they're paying. Um, for legal services, it's using data to make uh, informed decisions with the very slim and low amount of resources that you have. It's improved processes, uh, user-centered design, project management, a host of other things. So why does all this matter? Because lawyers have been adversely uh, you know, I have very adverse reactions historically to technology, innovation, and change. Um, but as you learned earlier, there's still a huge access to justice gap. So while other industries have disrupted and changed and innovated because of a problem, we still have a huge problem and not a lot of resources. So. Some lawyers are trying to uh, address this problem. Some, sometimes when I talk about technologies, I get this reaction where uh, lawyers are you know, interested in seeing how we can use other fields, multidisciplinary approaches to solve these problems. So what is access to justice and technology? That's why I'm here. Um, <laughs> it's, it's using the existing tools that we have, so document assembly, uh, tools, things that can complete legal forms for you, um, mobile technologies, getting access to legal information from your phone, uh, legal information portals that help you uh, guide you and direct you to legal information, uh, connect you with a lawyer, um, chatbots and artificial intelligence tools that can use uh, predictive learning. Uh, so this is another project that I'm working on with the State Courts of Alaska uh, in partnership with Microsoft to build a new legal access portal. And this portal will use natural language processing. So when you type in, just as you type in any search term in Google, hey, what are, I don't know, whatever you guys type in, but uh, you'll be able to shift from search term in your natural language to legal solution or so hypothetically, if you type in the portal, I'm getting kicked out of my house, it will guide you to potentially a landlord tenant issue, help you find available services uh, around that issue. Um, it'll also use not sh uh, machine learning and 
artificial intelligence, collect data over time to improve upon the system. And so here's the kind of innovation pipeline, I call it. Um, using data, using design, using tech, uh, using community, collaboration. Um, the whole goal is to basically augment the practice of law. What lawyers do today, uh, zealously represent their clients and advocate on their behalf, and integrate technology to improve their impact and scale and increase uh, what they do. Uh, so here's some of the challenges that technology has in the legal practice. Uh, privacy concerns, security, uh, you heard about the hack, uh, racist algorithms, uh, when you design solutions with, uh, you know, teams that aren't diverse, uh, the outcomes of those solutions uh, are uh, really embedded in the team design. And also just a huge digital divide. In, in rural Alaska, there's little to no internet. So how does a tech solution help? Outcomes. Uh, through technology, we can increase access, uh, we can reach farther communities, we can help clients get more self-sufficient on their legal matters. I know, we're talking about the other And finally, the future law needs you. Um, you all are the future. Um, the future law will require uh, a diverse, young cadre of legal engineers to basically redesign, reimagine, and reinvent the delivery of legal services. As, as much as you all are in tune to technologies, I think there were over 200 or something hashtags within a, a, a few hours. You all experience and use technologies on an everyday basis. Uh, there's over, I want to say 80% of the law, you know, lawyers are baby boomers, uh, you know, and resistance to technology. So you all will need this change of re reimagining uh, how law is delivered. So questions? Take maybe one or two. One question, anyone from Miguel? I have a question. Yo. How'd you do it? Do you have one quick piece of advice that they can take home? I take a huge risk and follow your passion. I'm, I'm passionate about this stuff and I just, I just follow my passion. Thank you, Miguel. Let's give a round of applause, guys. We have one question right now. One question? We're going to have to keep it rolling, if you don't mind. I have, I have, I have orders from higher ups. I'd want to hear your question. But we got a survey that's coming up. We got a survey coming up. So, so first, question. yep, go ahead. What's your question? My question was uh, where do you grow up and what high school do you went to and what uh, university and college do you go to? Thank you. <laughs> okay. For the last one, you should be listening because it was on the bottom point. Um, I, I grew up in D.C., uh, lived half my life in D.C., half my life in uh, Seattle. I went to high school, I went to three different high schools. I got kicked out of two high schools. Um, I had a really horrible GPA um, and I barely scraped into college. But it wasn't until I got into college where I was free to explore um, much more academic freedom. Um, so if you, any, for any of you who doubt themselves right now, one, it's not over. Um, I think you can succeed and do whatever you want and really explore whatever your passion is. I would advise you to see how the law can affect that area of, of, of passion that you have and whatever your career pursuits are. Thank you. Thank you, Miguel. Once Thanks again, so much, Miguel. Thank you. Yeah. We are going to announce the passport card winners, okay? And unfortunately, because we gave so many prizes out today, we don't actually have enough to give all 10 of the winners the cards today. I'm gonna give the top five cards today and mail the last five cards to you at your schools, okay? So expect to receive those in the mail. But here are the top five winners who will get gift cards right now. And then I'll say the top five, uh, or the last five, who will get it in the mail. Top five, Zachariah Rudd. Okay, 
grab your gift card. You can get yours today. Good job. Um, Brenda Mojica. Good job, Brenda. You had, let's see, Zachariah had 32 signatures and Brenda had 31. Um, Ivan Sanchez. Ivan, good job, 29. Let's see, Madison Stayrock. Good job, Madison. And the last person getting a gift card today is Miriam Gallardo. Here are the ones who are gonna get it in the mail. Miguel Esquivel. <laughs> okay, uh, Luis Garma. I can't quite read the handwriting. Luis, good job, Luis. Um, Isaiah Lint, you'll get it in the mail, and oh, hopefully they have their name on it, Cecilia Martinez, <laughs> Meredith Martin, you'll all get yours in the mail, okay, good job. So those are our passport card winners. So we have to move on. Who are our Instagram winners? Remember, we're only picking a few. We said we're gonna do three, but actually we're gonna do four. So look at our Instagram page. Like, you guys, when I told you to use the hashtag, you really did it. Like, we have more than 200 photos with that hashtag. So thank you for making it trending. Really, really appreciate it. You tagged us in a bunch, and it was really hard to choose. Here we go. First Instagram winner. Her IG name is lovely underscore pumpkin. Yay! Second, his IG name, I think, is brandon.is.hot. <laughs> brandon.is.hot. Good job. Good job, good job. Her Instagram name is Leilani underscore Esparza. Good job. And our last Instagram winner is m.ramirez23. Good job, guys. Thank you. And remember, if you come next year, you can also win if you keep tagging us, keep uh, using the hashtag. We could choose you as a winner for next year's Tri-Cities Forum. Oh, okay. All right, guys, here we go. Before you leave, we really need you to tell us how we did today. Okay? So here's what you're going to do. Take out your phone if you have Instagram. Click on our website that's on our page. Fill out the survey. Or you can do a paper copy. Paper copies are coming around. Fill them out. Leave them at your desk, okay? And then you all can go home. Thank you so much. Thank you guys, you did great.